Okay, hello everyone. Good morning, evening, afternoon, whatever it is in your neck of the woods. Uh, welcome uh, to another edition of Worldwide Neurodevelopmental Biology and uh, or Neural Development, sorry. And uh, it's a real pleasure to host uh, Gaia Novarino today because Gaia is also the host of a very uh, tightly related series on worldwide neuro on neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, so this is two two series talking to each other, <laughs> I guess. Uh, it's a real pleasure to to have the chance to host you, Gaia, and and, and uh, in in this in this series, um, because uh, I, I think I really like a lot the the work you do and and also the approach you take, which is the idea of trying to understand brain development from from the point of view of of neurodevelopmental disorders, which is uh, and and starting with you know g genetic mutations or searching for genes that that cause um, different neurodevelopmental disorders and understanding their impact because it, essentially this is the sort of loss of function approach to to the brain right and and at the same time it it's not a, a sort of a random loss of function approach which has of course its its strengths. Uh, but rather a loss of function approach that that deals with uh, matters that that are important for human health, and so um, combining the sort of basic research with with the potential for translation. And um, so Gaia did her uh, uh, PhD in Rome. Um, she then went to the Max Delbruck Center as a postdoc um, in the Jentsch lab, and then uh, to Joe Gleason's lab for, to continue her postdoc at, at UCSD. Um, oh, somebody's saying the video appears for oh, you. Just one person, they say that. Yeah, for us, it's, for us it's fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so Joe Gleason's lab as a postdoc, uh, you know, as a postdoc in both places, uh, Gaia published some uh, fantastic work on uh, where she began really her, her approach to, towards uh, neurodevelopmental de disorder. Uh, since 2014, she's uh, at the IST in Vienna, which is increasingly becoming an absolutely fantastic institute uh, with, with very talented people looking at all kinds of um, questions uh, of, in biology. Uh, Gaia was, of course, joined as an assistant professor, is now a full professor at the IST. She is a, a, a fence Kavli scholar. She uh, was awarded in ERC. She has a number of other awards, a merit award from the Italian Republic and so on. Um, one of my favorite uh, pieces of work from Gaia's lab is the, the story about the blood-brain barrier uh, mutation that gives rise to, uh, that potentially is involved in, in autism spectrum disorder. And she has continued along those lines, uh, looking at different genetic mutations and how they impact brain development and how that might explain the neurodevelopmental uh, disorder. So. Gaia, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to host you, you and the uh, floor is yours, so to speak. Let's try to see whether I make it work. So, I think that should work, right? Perfect, yes. Yeah, good. So, thank you very much, uh, first, for the nice introduction. I'm actually very happy that you like the blood brain barrier work because I'm going to actually show you uh, um, something about that as well today. Um, yeah, so as you introduced, I so my lab mostly works with uh, human disorders and we kind of use them in a way, both so on one side to try to understand really what are the basic mechanisms and the other, on the other side to understand what uh, um, eventually some uh, uh, molecules that are relevant for uh, development, or brain development in an unbiased way. So uh, particularly my lab is uh, focused on autism spectrum disorders. So those are uh, characterized as you probably, uh, all of you, many of you know, by social deficits, uh, which include also uh, problems in, uh, uh, in language communication, so verbal and nonverbal communication, and uh, the presence of repetitive behaviors. So now uh, those core features um, most often do not go alone, but in fact, they coexist with a number of other uh, symptoms and syndromes. 
including intellectual disability, motor problems, uh, anxiety, uh, epilepsy. So at the end, we are kind of studying not only the autistic kind of like features, but in fact, we are also interested in some of those uh, uh, comorbidities. As you also uh, mentioned uh, uh, at the very beginning or during the introduction, uh, um, what we are doing is kind of combining human genetic data. So in a way, in fact, uh, we're kind of using the human as our screening model to identify eventually genes that have a very high impact and very, uh, very relevant in the brain and, uh, and then use those uh, uh, or model those disorders, uh, uh, making the same genetic mutations that we find in humans uh, in animal models, uh, as well as we are using 2D and 3D uh, cell models. Now, the questions that we are trying to uh, answer with uh, uh, this uh, uh, approach, uh, um, there are several, of course. Uh, so on one side, we really try to understand what those genes that are uh, implicated uh, in those disorders are doing in, in the brain. I mean, you all know that there are about uh, 20,000 genes, uh, uh, and uh, of those, we have a really uh, a little information about uh, most of them. Uh, and, uh, and eventually, even when we know what is the molecular function of those genes, we have no clue what they are doing in the brain and what they are doing during brain development. On the other side, we really tried also to understand kind of more uh, general questions. For instance, uh, uh, what are the sensitive time periods that are, are affected by those genetic mutations? And this is not a trivial uh, and not an important question because, of course, it could be that certain genetic mutations have an effect at a very specific uh, time point while other mutations eventually have an effect throughout life. And this uh, requires eventually later on uh, a completely different type of management of the level of the treatment. And then finally, of course, we're also very much interested in the reversibility. So because those disorders are typically uh, um, um, diagnosed uh, uh, later in, in, in life, or later, so when, when a child eventually is already two or three years at least, um, can we do anything after day onset? Now, all of this kind would be uh, already kind of uh, tricky um, if we would talk about uh, uh, one or two genes uh, underlying those disorders. Uh, but actually, uh, 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 recently, actually yesterday, I've seen in Twitter uh, this uh, very nice uh, cartoon uh, is, was referring to polygenicity, but I think in general, um, so uh, also refers to, uh, to uh, monogenic disorders that are the ones that we are most focused on. So I have been in kind of both sides of the wall, so uh, doing genetics, but also doing functional experiments, and they really see how we are discovering more and more genes, but uh, uh, doing functional experiments, we are still uh, pretty much behind. And we have to try to make sense about uh, uh, all what, uh, um, uh, with the high throughput uh, genetic tools we, are, we have identified so far. So one way to kind of make sense of all those genes that have been associated, for instance, with autism is eventually to kind of connect them in, in different type of, of, or group them uh, based on their molecular function or their uh, localization. And then uh, kind of say that there is a sort of convergence between different genes that underlie the same disorder. So for instance, here for out spectrum disorders, we know that transcription of regulators as well as proteins related to uh, uh, regulation of protein levels, uh, uh, as well as synaptic uh, uh, development and plasticity uh, uh, encoding genes uh, are very important for those disorders. So today, uh, what I would like to do is actually just uh, make uh, uh, two examples on how uh, really uh, studying those disorders can help us to understand a little bit more about the brain and how uh, what are essential components of those uh, uh, of those uh, of brain development. So um, in order to do so, I will focus just on one of this class that is uh, uh, um, two stories that are both related with the control or apparently related with the control of protein levels. So one is uh, dealing with uh, uh, Calin-3, that is an E3 ubiquitin ligase, and the other with SLC75 and the CKDK that uh, is uh, linked to uh, blood chain amino acid availability. So let's start with Calin-3. So Calin-3, as I just mentioned, encodes for uh, E3 uh, uh, ubiquitin ligase. So in practice, what it does uh, is connecting uh, or targeting proteins uh, uh, for degradation or for the proteasomal degradation. 
So mutation in Calin3 have been found in the last few years uh, um, in, in several patients. And uh, mutations are, uh, are usually de novo, uh, um, um, either missense or friendships or stop mutations, so loss of function mutations. And uh, given that uh, so many mutations are, are known in patients without spectrum disorders so far, uh, this uh, gene is considered a very high confidence gene for out spectrum disorders, so that's what this core one means. So, um, as usual, so those are, as I say, are the novel mutation, meaning that uh, patients with mutation in Calin3 um, have heterozygous mutations. So, as usual, what we do is uh, generate a mouse model. And for me, it's very, very important to mention that uh, in this case, we really uh, kind of replicate or try to uh, mimic as much as possible what is happening in the patient. So we are really studying Calin3 plus minus model. Uh, um, uh, and uh, I think in this, uh, in this uh, uh, example, it's very important that we do so because as you will see, using, for instance, certain Creline eventually would mask some of the effects that uh, uh, we uh, think we underscore in this, uh, in this model. So um, those Calin3 plus minus animals, um, so in general, when, 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 whenever we are generating an animals, what we are doing at the very beginning is to uh, are characterizing them behaviorally. And I want to be clear in the fact that what we are kind of aiming to is not to say that those animals are autistic or to say that Calin3 is, uh, is related to autism because of what we are, see are seeing, but it kind of gives us an hint that uh, uh, eventually uh, um, Calin3 or the Calin3 plus minus model in this case is a good model to study eventually to, uh, uh, to study the disorder in humans. So in this case, uh, those animals have a number of different effects. So for instance, uh, they have a model uh, problems that we see really just, uh, on, on, uh, so they have a slight ataxia. Um, they also have uh, some uh, social or uh, sociability uh, issue or social memory uh, formation problems, so they, they kind of uh, um, uh, not recognize uh, uh, or not prefer to stay with a novel mouse compared to uh, a, a familiar mouse. So those are very classical type of, of behaviors. We are actually now moving to probably the next generation uh, of, of uh, behavioral assays, uh, but kind of tell us, and we have a battery of them, kind of tell us a few things. So first, that this is a good model. Second, we could not find real difference between males and females, which is always uh, important to assess. Uh, and uh, again, I mean, that, that this is a value model to use. Another thing that uh, we thought at that point, so when we started the work of, uh, on Calin3, we thought that eventually um, we would need to have some hints about when is, uh, are those uh, uh, developmental, what we call developmental defects, uh, eventually arising. And so one experiment we decided to do is to do, uh, use a, a Calin3 uh, CREER mouse, uh, where the Calin3 is not, so the PLOX mouse, uh, where a Calin3 is not knockout, uh, but then we, where we can induce uh, the lesion of one allele of Calin3 uh, later in life. So if we inject, so we do so by injecting uh, tamoxifen in, in those animals. So if we inject tamoxifen uh, when the animal is about 30 days old and uh, keep the injection for a few days, and then we wait uh, uh, about a month and then we repeat uh, uh, the behavioral assays that we did uh, in the plus minus animal, what we found is that those animals, uh, um, we did again the entire battery, those animals do not show any behavioral abnormalities. So this really told us uh, uh, that eventually calin tree is in fact very important during uh, uh, developmental stages, so earlier than P30, because if you delete the gene or one allele of the gene later on in life, you are not observing those uh, behavioral uh, um, problems. So uh, what then? So what is Calin3 doing? So we went back and uh, uh, we started doing some histology. We look at the brain, the brain, as you can see here. So this is, uh, um, this is the, as soon as I move the mouse. Um, um, so this is the uh, heterozygous model, uh, uh, and this is the uh, plus plus model. So as you can see, the brain looks uh, pretty much uh, uh, similar um, in the, two, in the two genotypes. Uh, however, when we looked, uh, so here you can see the cortex uh, P0 in, in, uh, in the two genotypes, uh, you may have, uh, uh, you may can see that uh, uh, the layering of the, the cerebral cortex is not uh, uh, completely comparable. 
So what we notice is eventually that some of the cells were kind of spread down and they were eventually not, uh, the layer was eventually not equally, uh, not compacted, but eventually would not reach the same level. So this kind of gave us the feeling that eventually calin-3 uh, deficiency or up insufficiency uh, may be linked to some uh, migration uh, problems so that eventually those cells are really not able to, uh, when they're forming, they are not able to go and reach their uh, final destination. So in order to test this in a better way, what we did is or we quantify that in a better way, uh, we injected BRDU in uh, E16.5 animals um, and we weighed them, uh, we let the, uh, the animal develop uh, and uh, we sacrificed them at P0. And so as you can see here, when we do that, uh, um, um, we can then label, uh, uh, do immune stainings for the BRU that is intercalating in, uh, in the cells that they were developing at E16.5. And as you can probably notice, uh, those cells indeed that they were forming at the same time were not able to reach the same uh, um, um, level in the cortical plane. So you can see this uh, here, uh, the quantification. So you see that in the upper, uh, layer part of the cortex, eventually there are less neurons or BRQ positive neurons, uh, and there are more in the lower layers, so, uh, meaning that some of those neurons that got stranded at the bottom uh, part. So in order to um, so um, understand a little bit better uh, what is uh, what the calin 3 is doing and why eventually is leading to this migration, we decided a problem. We decided to do some proteomic analysis, and we decided to do that because obviously if calin 3 is uh, uh, absent, or in this case is uh, uh, reducing quantity, you could imagine that uh, um, the uh, targeted protein are not getting ubiquitinated, and so they are not targeted to the proteasomal degradation, and therefore uh, the target protein uh, level is increasing. So we did uh, then uh, TMT labeling of uh, wild type and, uh, and mutant uh, calin 3 uh, brains, so again, the upper insufficient model. And we got that uh, indeed there are several proteins uh, uh, here on, on the right side of this graph that uh, are upregulated uh, or have higher levels and, and a few of some others uh, that eventually are downregulated. So among the down regulated, of course, we find calin 3, which we expected because uh, we also, of course, checked that um, the upper insufficient model was valid. So we have about 50% of the amount of calin 3, um, as well as uh, many others uh, uh, proteins. So when we do go time analysis, I mean, uh, we often do this uh, um, just to have an idea. Um, at the end, what we just got is what we kind of knew already is that uh, uh, those mutants, uh, animals, or those mutant brain have a problem in cell migration regulation. And uh, uh, also what was very interesting that a number of different proteins that are related to actin binding and uh, cell addition eventually were uh, disturbed. So in order to test uh, or study these uh, phenotypes a little bit better, what we did is we moved to an in vitro system uh, where we uh, uh, obtain neuroprogenitor cells from uh, uh, the Cali-3 uh, mouse model, and then we let them migrate uh, in vitro. And so this is a very nice system. So we did that by starting from neurospheres or in a more simple 2D system. But what is nice is that here you can really track those cells over the course of several hours. And that's exactly what you see here. So each of these lines is one cell moving over the course of about 48 hours. And you can really see that the calin 3 mutant here in blue uh, travel eventually less. And we also know that have a, 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 a decrease, decreased velocity compared to their uh, wild type. So indeed, uh, um, what we observed in the, in the um, uh, mouse uh, in vivo, um, that those cells cannot migrate uh, uh, properly is also maintained in, in, uh, in vitro. And also is, uh, uh, we can say by using this assay, that this is uh, most probably a cell autonomous effect. So what next? Um, because we, in the proteomic analysis, we found uh, uh, that the uh, actin proteins were eventually disturbed, uh, as well, there was something about the uh, leading edge of the, of the uh, migrating cell. Um, we, they decided to go to one of our friends here at IST that does super resolution microscopy and uh, uh, staining uh, those cells in vitro for acting and for tubing. 
So after doing that, what we did uh, is doing an analysis to see what was the uh, what is the directionality of the uh, actin cytoskeletal and uh, the tubuli. Um, so we color code basically, so if it was parallel to the direction of the migration of the leading edge, uh, eventually the color was uh, more bluish, uh, and this is study if it's more uh, 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 perpendicular to the uh, direction of the leading edge, eventually it's, uh, it's a uh, um, color in yellow or in red. So that's how those pictures are looking like. So this is the actin uh, cytoskeleton, this is the tubulin uh, uh, um, um, staining. And so, and this is the color coded base uh, on the directionality. And as you can see, uh, while uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the wild type uh, cells, uh, um, the, the, the actin cytoskeleton is kind of well uh, uh, directed. So obviously it's a Gaussian distribution, but it's well directed uh, in parallel to the leading edge of this migrating cell. Uh, in the uh, mutant animal, this organization is kind of more, um, random in a way. Um, this is a weather, so this is referred to the actin cytoskeleton, but this is not uh, instead uh, observed when we stay for the tubulin. So meaning that really is something with the actin cytoskeletal dynamics that eventually is uh, 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 um, um, affected in those cells. So in order to do a little step forward to understand um, uh, what exactly eventually could determine this uh, abnormal actin cytoskeletal dynamic, we went back to our proteomic analysis and we added uh, um, um, at this point also the analysis, the proteomic analysis of other two animal models. Was, was, one is the, a conditional model where we uh, conditionally deleted uh, 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 Kali-3 in the IMEX-1 uh, expressed in cells uh, as heterozygous and as homozygous. What we were interested to see is, first of all, what were the, um, the proteins that were consistently uh, um, linked and directly linked to Kali-3 levels. And second, whether uh, we wanted to understand whether uh, making a kind of more profound deletion of Kali-3, uh, we could also affect uh, some sort of uh, those uh, uh, response. And indeed, this was the case. Uh, there was one, especially one protein that was always popping up, that is this PLS3 or plastin tree, that was consistently uh, affected in all our uh, data sets. And most important, or not most importantly, but uh, also importantly, uh, it was uh, um, uh, inversely proportional basically to Kalin 3 levels. So the least amount of Kalin 3 you have, so in a full homozygous. Uh, knockout or brain knockout, uh, there is a much more level of plastin-3 than in the heterozygous and then uh, of the uh, uh, wild type. So um, then I have to say, I mean, uh, just telling the truth, uh, so we were already focusing on this, uh, on this uh, uh, plastin-3 uh, protein, but then I think I was lucky enough that I was working around the institute uh, and I was uh, looking at the, at the poster that I didn't know um, uh, um, uh, uh, here at IST. And I noticed that another group that is actually studying a uh, cancer cell uh, and uh, uh, for other reason had uh, by, uh, by chance a plastin tree knockout. And the claim was that this plastin tree knockout eventually uh, would move uh, much faster, that those cells would move much faster than the wild type cells. So uh, this was actually telling us that uh, this was exactly the opposite that we were observing eventually in our, uh, our Kalin-3 mutant. And so this uh, 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 induced us to make a, a, an experiment also in the, um, our neural cells. And uh, indeed what we find is that when we knock out plastin-3, uh, we have those cells are moving uh, faster and longer distances. Uh, while when we overexpress uh, uh, plastin-3, those cells are moving at a, at a, a, a lower speed, uh, with a lower speed and uh, um, uh, shorter distances. So this is done in the context of a Kalin-3 wild type. So indeed, it seems that when we are when Kalin-3 is mutated, it leads to this uh, a kind of increase of plastin-3, and because of this, uh, those cells that get slower and cannot migrate properly. So of course, uh, 
Um, so if we do then a knockout or a knockdown of plastin three in the uh, calin three plus minus uh, 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 um, uh, model, so um, those cells, as, as uh, I was mentioning before, they are moving slower, exactly like the plastin three overexpression uh, model. Um, when we do the knockout or the knockdown in the in the calin three plus minus model, uh, this uh, uh, migration problem is uh, uh, fully rescued. So um, furthermore, we think that plastin-3 is indeed really linked to the actin uh, cytoskeleton um, uh, conformation of problems in the dynamics that we were observing by uh, actin um, um, uh, stainings. And uh, indeed, uh, um, so just the plastin-3 overexpression leads to that redistribution or that uh, uh, kind of different arrangement of the actin cytoskeleton in those migrating cells. So um, what we have basically found studying this uh, uh, calin 3 uh, gene is that uh, upper insufficiency of this gene has a, a role uh, in uh, early development and this uh, so upper insufficiency uh, in early development leads to abnormal behaviors uh, and that uh, most probably at least part of those behaviors uh, may be uh, linked to a defect in migration of the uh, uh, neurons uh, or newly formed neurons uh, uh, that uh, is due to an increase of plastin-3 that uh, um, is a, a, a actin bundling protein and uh, um, that when you have too much of this plastin-3 protein, you end up with a kind of stiff uh, actin cytoskeleton that is not uh, rearranged properly in the directionality of the, of the um, migration and therefore make, um, probably makes the cell uh, much uh, stiffer and much slower in moving. So um, that is uh, that much about calin-3. And so uh, now let me move to uh, the second part uh, of, of my talk um, that is dealing with uh, BCKDK and SLC75. So um, this is actually, a, it's, a, it's really a, a very, very exciting project that we have at the moment. And it's one of those projects that um, when we started in part, uh, um, I thought that would be just boring because we would know uh, the answer already, but really this, uh, uh, it seems that is not the case. So this entire story um, started back when I was uh, still a postdoc in, uh, um, in San Diego, UCSD, and started from those three families. So now those three families, they are um, different from the, um, the, the calin 3 kind of situation in the way that uh, calin 3 mutations are found in uh, outbred basically populations or uh, our population in, a, in a, an in de novo type of uh, um, um, mutation. So meaning that the parents of calin 3 are usually not affected, uh, have no mutations uh, and the mutation is uh, popping up de novo in the, in the affected uh, um, um, uh, children. In this case, what we're looking at uh, is actually a different case, is uh, 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 those pedigrees are uh, uh, consanguineous families, so meaning that the parents of the kids that we are uh, studying uh, are um, most often uh, um, first cousins. And so the model of, uh, of uh, inheritance of those uh, mutations much, much more rare. Um, so calin 3 for instance, is rare, but not as rare as this one. Um, and is much, much more rare and uh, eventually so very penetrant uh, and, uh, um, and is autosomal recessive, it follow an autosomal recessive model. So those three families, as I say, um, where uh, I started studying them when I was at UCSD and uh, uh, the, the people that you can see here in red, they're all affected by an out spectrum disorder, uh, motor deficits, as well as a, a, a very mild uh, microcephaly. So there's a decrease in brain size. So um, we, at that point, what we did is sequencing, um, do all, all whole exome sequencing of all the affected patients, so here in red, and of some of the uh, sibling or unaffected siblings. And uh, what we found is that all the affected patients shared a, a different type of uh, uh, nonsense and missense mutations in the BCKDK. A gene. So basically the case stands for branched chain ketoacid dehydrogenase kinase. So I will not repeat that again. 
but let me just shortly tell you uh, what it's doing. So first of all, the branching amino acids uh, um, um, are three amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Those are three essential amino acids, meaning that there is absolutely no cell in our body that can uh, uh, really synthesize them. And so the only way for us to uh, get them is through our, uh, our diet. So now for some reason, uh, which uh, we don't understand still fully, but for some reason, the level of those uh, uh, branching amino acids really needs to stay within a certain uh, uh, defined level. And so because of that, there is uh, obviously a catabolic pathway that when there are too man many uh, branching amino acids uh, uh, allows the degradation of, of them. Now, BCKDK is uh, encoding for a, a key enzyme, a key kinase, uh, that uh, uh, phosphorylate and does uh, inactivate this catabolic pathway. Okay, so the only thing that here you need to know is that when BCKDK is mutated, like in our patients, uh, this pathway is uh, overactive and therefore is continuously degrading branch chain amino acids. Now, um, indeed, if we go to our patients, so this is just one of the family, Again, uh, the individual in red are an individual with uh, uh, so of, of one family affected individuals, and the one in green are instead uh, uh, the unaffected individuals of the same family. When we measure the level of amino acids in their serum, you immediately notice that. So here, the gray bar is the normal level of each of those amino acids in a, in a classical population. And you see that in the majority of the cases, uh, the level of uh, uh, amino acid, of the specific amino acids in the, um, in, uh, uh, in the patients is equal to uh, what you would expect normally. But obviously, if you go here on the uh, right uh, bottom side of, the, of this uh, uh, graph, you see that the patients have uh, much lower levels uh, of valine, lysin, and lysolysin. So this is, was exactly the prediction. So this BCKDK gene is not probably working. Or actually, it's not uh, the, uh, what we found in those patients specifically is a nonsense mediated decay. So uh, we don't have a protein. And so because of that, this catabolic pathway is continuously active and, uh, and continuously degrading valine, leucine, and lesolacin, and therefore those patients have a very low levels of those amino acids in their blood. So um, that was, uh, and we, we did, uh, we did uh, some modeling in the mouse, uh, the mouse uh, lacking uh, or uh, uh, BCK decay, um, also have low level of branching amino acids in the blood, do also have uh, low levels of branching amino acids in their brain. Again, it's, it's kind of trivial, right, because uh, uh, the brain can also not synthesize those amino acids, so those amino acids uh, obviously follow kind of the concentration that there is uh, in, in the blood. And those patients have autism, pattern disorders, motor issues, epilepsy, and this mild microcephaly. Now, one of the questions at this point was uh, whether, why those people have this uh, type of uh, of uh, disorder. And so one of the of the thought that we had at that point or a few years later, it was that uh, um, if the branching amino acids are very uh, relevant in the brain, no matter if you lower them um, by lowering their level uh, in the blood uh, or by lowering their level directly in the brain, the effect should be the same. And so uh, basically we, we say that there must be eventually a condition uh, that uh, um, where the patients have uh, normal levels of branching amino acids uh, in the blood, but eventually low levels of the branching amino acids in the brain, because in fact those uh, branching amino acids are transported from the uh, uh, blood into the brain uh, at the level of the blood-brain barrier by uh, a transport that is encoded by the gene SLC75. So the thought here was, if we block, or if, we, if there are patients that where this uh, transporter is not functional, eventually the level of branching amino acids should be equally affected like the patients with BCKDK mutation, and those should have the same type of disorder if those amino acids are indeed relevant. 
And indeed, this is the case. Um, so, um, in fact, in the same cohort where we had also this EKDK, there were also other patients with mutations in the gene SLC75. Um, this is a very large family, so genetically uh, extremely informative if you do segregation. And those uh, uh, patients uh, carry mutations, uh, missense mutations of very well conserved amino acids. Um, so eventually very relevant. We also showed that those amino acids are relevant uh, for transport and eventually for uh, the amount of protein uh, that is in, 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 the, in the cells that we obtain from those patients. Those patients indeed have uh, autism spectrum disorders, motor deficits, and they have a very severe microcephaly, much more severe, in fact, of the BCKDK patients. So, um, we did some uh, mouse work, uh, and, was, uh, uh, and specifically what we did is deleting SLC75 just from the endothelial cells of the blood brain barrier. And those animals have uh, uh, autism like features, let's say, motor issues, and have a reduced inhibitory transmission. Most importantly, what we noticed is that if we injected uh, a leucine and auxiliousine, when those animals are already uh, um, uh, P40, over the course of about three weeks, uh, um, we could rescue uh, all the phenotypes, at least the ones that we have looked at. And this was not, uh, is not uh, trivial because uh, some of the sociability uh, problems we cannot really check because uh, those animals with this uh, big pump cannot really be placed in social tests afterwards. But yet we could make sure that in a way that uh, um, the, the, the phenotypes we were observing in those mice uh, lacking the SLC75 uh, in the, in the uh, blood brain barrier were due to, uh, at least in part, to the absence of leucine and oxaleucine in the brain. Now, one thing, um, in fact, we could not find, and this was the severe microcephaly. So uh, I mentioned, so those patients have all severe microcephaly. They have up to a minus five standard deviation of the brain size or head size. So just to recap, microcephaly is, uh, is, a, is a malformation that, uh, or a decrease in, in brain size um, with uh, an otherwise normal, uh, morphologically normal uh, brain. And uh, I would say that SLC75 mutations leads to this severe microcephaly, um, again, to this uh, about minus five standard deviation. So the question here was why um, the animals where we are deleting SLC75 uh, from the blood brain barrier do not show this uh, mild microcephaly. And at that point, um, I, I had a very, very, uh, we had a very, very easy explanation. So um, SS75 is at the blood brain barrier, but very early on, when the brain uh, of the neuroprogenitor cells are proliferating, the blood brain barrier is not really tight. So eventually, uh, branching amino acids can really leak into the brain uh, um, in other ways. Yet, we thought our patients have microcephaly, so maybe to compensate for this kind of diffusion of branching amino acids, uncontrolled diffusions of branching amino acids in the brain, maybe at that point, SLC75 is expressed in the neuroprogenitor cells, which makes a lot of sense. Those are cells that are proliferating, and SLC75 is a transporter for branching amino acids that eventually sustain a cell growth and the proliferation. And so uh, we made this hypothesis, and then uh, we decided just very easily to cross uh, our flux SLC75 animal with an EMIX Cree animal. And uh, um, uh, the hypothesis there was just that to, um, to look at P0 animals, and we were sure that those animals would show a, 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 a very much reduced brain size. But here was uh, uh, the first surprise, and sorry, this picture is not uh, the best, but. Uh, um, um, Believe me, so those brain are indeed slightly reduced in size, uh, but in fact, when we do the, the, um, the entire analysis and statistics, uh, it's not even significant difference. And so we were really kind of disappointed because we could not uh, uh, understand what was going on. And, uh, and we even thought that maybe the microcephaly was, given, it was due to some uh, systemic effect of SLC75 somewhere else, not in the brain. 
But actually, Lisa in the lab uh, did uh, a very important experiment uh, and uh, got the animals much later, up to 40. And as you can see here, the brain is really strongly reduced. So um, again, here we're using an MAX animal, so we are affecting just the cortex, but the cortex, as you can see here, and from these uh, pictures and from this quantification, is reduced of about 40% uh, compared to, uh, uh, of about 40% uh, um, compared to the wild type. So this is really kind of recapitulate what we, uh, we thought was uh, a strong microcephaly that we see in the patients. So now the question was, when is exactly this microcephaly emerging? So uh, we followed the animals and uh, uh, um, we did a time course of uh, uh, calculating the brain weight over time. And we have seen that we observed that basically that indeed this microcephaly that we were, um, that those animals have was kind of emerging between P0 to uh, about P10. And uh, I'll, I'll go back, of course, uh, to that later. Now, obviously, I mean, measuring brain weight is, uh, is uh, and brain thickness or cortical thickness is, is good, but it's not super quantitative. But again, I mean, we are very, very lucky to have here another colleague um, that has, has a very good system that is the modern system uh, that allows us uh, to link a color with a genotype. I'm sure that most of you here probably um, will already know the modern system, but just shortly uh, to uh, recap what is happening here. So we have, uh, uh, using this model, we have the possibility to have wild, an uh, wild type animals with, uh, uh, sorry, with uh, uh, red and green cells, uh, both wild types, so plus plus for SLC 75, in a wild type context. This uh, uh, one important point is that, as the image already suggests here, is that this labeling is very sparse, so allows to uh, really uh, nicely quantify and, and count how many cells you have uh, that are either red or green. Then you can also obtain a condition in which you have uh, what uh, uh, Simon calls the modern mosaic uh, um, that has uh, um, uh, is a as an environment, uh, all cells are plus minus, in this case, plus minus for SLC75. And then there are a few cells that are plus plus for SLC75, and those are, in this case, uh, coloring red, and some cells that instead are minus minus for SLC75, and those, in this case, are colored in green. Now, this approach gives you the possibility to count precisely how many green and red cells you have, and what you would expect is that, uh, uh, for instance, in a wild type conditions, the ratio between green and red cells should be equal to one. And so that uh, is the experiment that we did. So we calculated how many green uh, uh, cells over red cells we have in the wild type situation, and how many uh, uh, green over red cells we have uh, in, the, in the mosaic situation. So here we have uh, uh, where the uh, red, green cells are uh, mutant for SLC 75 and the red uh, wild type. So this is the quantification. So we did again over the course of three different time points, P0, P5, and P14. And as you can see here, now we have a really nice quantification of what we are observing in kind of a gross morphological analysis that we have shown to you before. So here are P0, you can see that uh, in the wild type, we have exactly green over red, uh, so um, a ratio is uh, equal one. And in the mutant, in the mosaic, so uh, uh, we have a slightly um, but non-significant reduction of green cells. However, this reduction becomes much more prominent uh, later on a P4, a P5 and a P40, and it seems that affects primarily uh, upper layers. So why? Um, so what it seems that was happening here is that the, the cells are indeed formed correctly, um, so it's not a proliferation issue. So the animal is born with a normal amount of, uh, of cells, but later on in life, so immediately after birth, those cells eventually are lost. And indeed, I say they are lost. We did uh, um, some um, um, Clifka uh, uh, space uh, three analysis, both by immunostainings and Western blood. 
And what we found is uh, uh, it was very remarkable uh, in the sense that uh, uh, indeed those cells are lost between P0 and P10, but really um, the entire loss of cells is really confined in this very precise period that is P0 to P10. Now, um, I'm sure if the ones that uh, among you that study cortical development probably know already when you see this curve, uh, probably get in mind another curve and other works uh, um, related to this. So uh, previous work have shown that uh, um, in the cortex, there is a wave of apoptosis uh, in the mouse uh, between P0 to, P, um, um, to P10. Uh, that is uh, um, characterized by this uh, uh, increase in, uh, in uh, cliff caspase uh, 3 staining. So this is exactly what we are seeing in our model. So this very confined uh, uh, cell death in this very uh, early period. I guess that those of you that study those uh, uh, cortical development also know that uh, um, Oscar Marin uh, had a, a very nice paper where he described that uh, this, uh, um, uh, this wave of apoptosis of excitatory neurons uh, is actually followed by a loss of uh, inter interneurons uh, uh, just a few days after. And so what we decided to do here is obviously to go back and to check the number of interneurons uh, in the cortex of those animals. And in fact, what we found is that uh, uh, the number of PV positive cells is uh, uh, significantly reduced uh, in the mutant animals, so in the IMAX, CRE, as well as the 75 animals in the upper layers. However, um, this is not a general effect on, on cell uh, viability. And I should remind you here that here the interneurons have a, a normal level of SLC75. So we are affecting just uh, SLC75 in the IMAX, uh, so uh, 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 eventually uh, projection neurons. And uh, this is not a general um, um, problem in cells, and eventually um, there are less amino acids around, uh, because, uh, uh, in fact, astrocytes and microglia cells, they are completely unaffected. So the number of those cells is completely normal. So uh, we, we really like, so uh, until this point, so what we, we could see is that uh, eventually, in mouse, we were getting a, a exaggerated wave of apoptosis between P0 to P10, and this is linked to the microcephaly. Now, we were lucky enough, in fact, that uh, um, not too long ago, um, a medical doctor from the a medical university in Vienna uh, uh, called us uh, to tell that they had uh, two new patients with SLC75 mutations. And what we were really lacking in this case is that they have a really, really nice characterization and they have their um, head size uh, um, um, measured uh, over the course of several years uh, very frequently. And so here I'm showing just one of those patients. And so um, what you can see is that those patients are born already with a very mild microcephaly. So we are talking about a minus two standard deviation. And within the first uh, seven uh, to eight months or seven months of age, uh, they are kind of uh, um, diverging very much. So here would be the curve of the two standard deviation. And they're diverging to get to a minus five standard deviation where they stay from about seven months of age on. So they, they maintain this type of uh, difference uh, uh, with uh, um, the normal um, brain cell uh, head size. And this is remarkable because, in fact, when we look at humans, we see that this wave of apoptosis is exactly going from uh, slightly before birth to about uh, seven to eight months of age. So this is really correspond to this curve. So uh, how does SLC75 affect neuronal survival at those very early postnatal stages? So there, are, there were several possibilities. Um, and uh, here I want to mention a few. So first of all, we know that uh, uh, branching amino acids, especially leucine, is sensed by the mTORP complex. And this eventually leads to, uh, could lead to problem in protein synthesis and cell growth. 
Um, we know also that uh, it leads to expression of a number of, uh, so depletion of, brand, uh, of amino acids can lead to expression of a number of genes connected to the unfold protein response and, and therefore near stress. And finally, um, the final product of the degradation of branching amino acids is also important for energy making in, in several different ways. So obviously, any of this uh, uh, could lead to a cellular loss uh, uh, during early development. And you could argue that uh, very early, so during this uh, uh, postnatal uh, uh, week or 10 days, uh, those cells are just somehow more sensitive, and so eventually they would die. However, we basically test uh, each of them, or we are still testing each of them one by one. We did not find uh, whatsoever evidence of mTOR pathway activation associated defects. There are no cell growth differences, so those neurons they are not smaller. Um, their dendritic arborization seems uh, equal. We also did not find any evidence of ER stress uh, by EM and by also checking by one by one all the potential pathways using Western blood analysis um, that are linked to UPR and ER stress response. And finally, although we are still uh, checking this, uh, at least uh, um, um, based on um, some, uh, um, some data, we, we, we think that there is no metabolic differences uh, um, underlying this disorder. Most importantly, we think that, in fact, all of this, so what I just mentioned, was all dependent on branching amino acids level. But in fact, I would argue that eventually what we are observing is not branching amino acids level dependent. And uh, um, indeed, uh, when we are blocking uh, from the blood-brain barrier the branching amino acid entry into the brain, so we are stopping uh, the, the blood-brain barrier mutant that, uh, that I mentioned to you, where we have low level of branching amino acids, those animals do not have microcephaly. So we think this is not branching amino acid dependent. Furthermore, if we're looking at the BCKDK patients, and those were the very first patients I mentioned where we had this low level of BCKDK uh, um, or branching amino acids in both in the blood and in the brain, those are patients, they have a mild microcephaly, but their microcephaly is much milder. So it's, uh, they are born with minus two standard deviation, but the curve then stays uh, uh, pretty much on the minus two standard uh, deviation uh, part. So uh, they really uh, look at the beginning similar, but in fact, they are different. So um, the idea here was, and I have to say that here was uh, Lisa that is working in this project that kind of from the very beginning thought that this uh, would be a possibility that SLC75 uh, modulates uh, uh, cell survival in some other way, eventually in a branch in amino acid independent way. Now uh, we went through the literature and we kind of were lucky to, found, uh, to find that uh, um, um, someone else found SLC75 in a screening for uh, um, um, interacting proteins and modifiers of the KV1.2 potassium channel. So uh, in fact, uh, it seems that uh, this is not just true for KV1.2, but also for KV1.1. It seems that SLC75 in X cells, but also in neuronal cells, interacts uh, physically with those two channels. So those two channels, uh, um, so you can, as you can see here, they're actually important for the modulation of the action potential of the neuron. And especially, it seems that it's important, so it's expressed at the axon initial segment and eventually are important for modulating the action potential um, uh, threshold as well as the fiery frequency. So then, uh, if you know, again, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the literature uh, on this uh, redefinement or refinement of the cerebral cortex early in development, um, it's uh, not a surprise that then we made the, um, connected the dots and then we say, okay, maybe what if SLC75 is modulating the activity uh, uh, of uh, those neurons early in life? And so we went on and we measure, or Bernadette measure, uh, the action potentials and the firing rates and the, and the properties of the action potential in, uh, in uh, wild type, in mutant animals between P6 and P7. 
And as you can see already from this image, uh, indeed we have a huge difference. You can recognize the, the basically uh, uh, those traces by eye, uh, and there are huge differences in the firing frequency and the number of spikes uh, uh, in the mutant animals compared to the wild type. So here are the traces. And most importantly, this is not a general effect that SOS7 5 has, but this effect on firing rates seems to be really confined to very early in development. So when we do the same experiment in animals that are P25 to P26 old, there is no difference. Now, one of the possibilities that we had here, it was that maybe uh, those cells uh, um, are just immature, and, uh, and so then, um, therefore, they are dying. But actually, the data that we collect would say the other way around. And this is maybe a bit provocative, and in a way, we have still to uh, um, um, really demonstrate this. But what we found is, in fact, that the, the, the shape and the characteristic of the action potential in the uh, P6 to P7 mutant animals were resembling more closely the uh, um, uh, a more mature neuron. So you can see this very well here. So what we have here, here is uh, the, uh, the uh, wild type animals, mutant animals, a P6, P25, P6, and P25. And that you can see is that the type of characteristic that uh, the, uh, so the, for instance, the action potential amplitude in P6 to P7 mutant animal resemble pretty much what you have in the wild type in P25 to P26 wild type animals and is uh, uh, significantly different from wild type animals at P6. And this is true for the rise time as well for the uh, action potential threshold um, um, in the same way, but does not affect uh, other properties of the action potential. So now there was uh, one uh, question still, I mean, we have still many questions left, but one uh, question that was kind of bothering us, uh, and the, the, the question was like, maybe what we are seeing here is, has nothing to do or has, uh, is not directly uh, 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 connected with that SLC75 function, but this effect on the firing properties eventually are independent or kind of homeostatic mechanism because SLC75 is eventually adjusting something else, and so the cells eventually uh, adjust uh, the firing properties. And so in order to answer to this question, we went back to our modern system. And what Bernadette here did is to patch wild type cells and mutant cells in, in, in the system. So in this case, we have all cells are plus minus, except the green that are minus minus and the red that are plus plus. And as you can see here, we can find really the exact same differences. So indeed, uh, um, the firing rate of those neurons is cell autonomously affected in those animals. So um, here I would like to conclude, uh, um, leaving to uh, with the, uh, the, our hypothesis, and namely is that just early in development, uh, so very early between P0 to P10, uh, uh, SLC75 may indeed interact and modulate uh, uh, the KV uh, 1.2 and 1.1 channels, we actually have to uh, um, still understand what are the different components. And again, I mean, there is a, a lot of speculation, there are a few things that really we need to uh, double check uh, yet. And this leads to kind of uh, uh, the normal action potential that is observed in wild type cells. Now, in the in older animals, eventually, we don't know if this uh, association is not happening anymore because also C75 levels are dropping or for any other reason, uh, but the, uh, eventually the shape of the action potential changed as uh, in, in uh, mature neurons. And at the same time, some, cell, some cells are lost. And so you get to the uh, more mature type of cortex. However, what we think it may happen in SLC75 mutant animals is that the lack of SLC75 leads to this different type of uh, more mature type of uh, action potential, yet a lower frequency, and maybe this uh, uh, decreasing frequency and uh, of activity is the, the, the thing that leads to an excessive cell death, uh, and so to the microcephaly that observe in, in SLC75 animals. So with this, I conclude, and I hope that what I've shown to you is a bit how 
looking at human disorders, we can understand a bit in an unbiased way uh, how different genes are contributed to uh, uh, brain development. Eventually also gave you a feeling about uh, how uh, uh, different genes can contribute to different phenotypes at different uh, uh, developmental windows. Uh, and I didn't talk about uh, uh, much about reversibility. It just gave you uh, a hint about that, that uh, eventual injection of isoleucine and leucine could reverse some of the phenotypes. And with this, I want to conclude, of course, uh, thanking all my people. So the work uh, um, I have shown to you is mostly the work on Kalin3 from Jasmine and Lena. Um, and the work on SLC75 uh, is the work of Lisa with the great help of Bernadette that here um, is already, you can just see a rig actually, because probably she's a rig almost. But uh, um, so this is, I think, the, the current group picture that we have. And with this, I uh, conclude and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any question. Okay, thank you very much, Gaia, for this fascinating, uh, wonderful survey of your work. Um, we'll start, I guess, with the questions that are in the box. So the first question is from uh, Steph Bolak, who asks, uh, could SL uh, could SLC seventy five seven A five sorry be considered as an epilepsy gene rather than an ASD gene? Yeah, I mean, the, oh, sorry, it's just, uh, that's that's a very interesting question. In fact, uh, um, yes, uh, some of of the patients uh, we have have also epilepsy. Um, so the answer is yes, but not always. And uh, the reason why not all patients have epilepsy, um, I, I don't fully understand them. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether there could be some connection with, with what I just showed about this interaction with the potassium channels. Maybe uh, if you have mutations that do not affect the, the amount of proteins, this interaction can still happen, but I really have no clue. But in some cases we see uh, epilepsy, in some others we don't. Okay, so the next question is from uh, Richard Smith, and he asks, uh, did you do a voltage clamp and show that a change in potassium channel, uh, show a change in potassium channel current amplitude? Yeah, so we are doing that, and uh, we indeed find some differences, but uh, I would say, to, so, um, Separating those currents from all, so from in slices, from all the potassium channels that there are is not uh, very trivial, at least not in our hands. Um, but we are doing that and we detect some differences, but I would like to um, have more um, data on that. Uh, the next question is from uh, Eamon Fitzgerald, who says, great talk. Would you be willing to speculate about the nature of the interaction between uh, SLC7A5 and the potassium channel and, and how, uh, how it might modulate it? I guess how SLC might modulate the channel. Well, I think it's really, so I mean, if I really want to do the, the speculation is that uh, eventually SLC75 acts in that very specific time window as a beta subunit. But uh, um, I know that they're physically interacting. Um, we need to do much more of uh, some, some experiment more and we are doing exactly to address this question, whether it's acting as a beta subunit, uh, uh, where they are expressed exactly at that time period, if, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, how I mean, we are doing a few rescue experiments, uh, looking at some amino acids that the people that have identified the interaction eventually highlight as potential important for interaction. Okay, uh, Rita Cardoso Figueiredo. I hope I'm saying this correctly. It says, great talk, thank you. I might have missed something, but given that BCAs are, uh, BCA supplementation could rescue the behaviors you observed impaired, but then other results showed that microcephaly is independent of the level of BCAs. Does this mean that the microcephaly is not really what is causing the behavioral defect? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. In fact, I didn't show here, but we did also the behavioral analysis of the of the microcephaly model, uh, and uh, those animals they do have behavioral uh, features, 
but the behavior of features are kind of opposite. So for instance, uh, uh, to, the, to the, the behavior of features that we found in the, in the blood brain barrier model. So for instance, uh, the blood brain barrier model has these severe motor phenotypes that are also observed, uh, uh, some motor phenotypes were also observed in the neuronal model. Uh, but both animals are hyperactive and the other animals are not. So it's very difficult to, to claim. So uh, the, the best would be uh, really to do the supplementation in a fully um, mutant animals, so blood brain barrier and a neuronal uh, model, which we haven't done yet. And just to mention, in the mouse, uh, the, the homozygote was mutant is little. So this is something, and that's probably why in humans we keep finding missense mutation because maybe there is some kind of uh, um, left uh, activity or left uh, um, protein. No, no, protein, no, but eventually, yes, that's actually. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Natalie Yurishiakshi is asking, uh, is saying beautiful work, is the amino acid transporter activity necessary for modulating the potassium channel or are these two functions of the SLC transporter uh, yeah. independent functions? Yeah. Yes. Could you speculate on why this transporter has evolved to different functions? Yeah, that's a, that actually the, the the second part of the question is really the part of the question that I, I would I love to speculate on that. But let's go to the first part. So it seems that uh, um, that it is independent uh, uh, of the um, the branch in amino acid transport because uh, uh, when the people that found interaction uh, um, were looking at the modulation of the KV channel. So now we are collaborating also, and we are. We are getting some mutant from them, but uh, when we're looking at the modulation of the channel, uh, they um, they also use one of our mutants. So the, the one of the mutations that we found in patients, and we knew that this was uh, transport back, and uh, still this was modulating the activity of the KV channel. Now with the second part, uh, yes, I love to speculate on that. I mean, I find super fascinating the idea that uh, during a very particular period of life early on a nutrient-linked uh, um, uh, transporter is uh, modulating activity. And uh, I think um, in part this is, uh, you know, in the Drosophila field, uh, I think there is there are a couple of mutants of transporters that are linked with nutrient that in fact are also modulating behavior. So I'm wondering whether this is a sort of a similar situation uh, although, um, I mean, I think in general, we cannot ask why evolution do something. So I, I, I don't know, maybe they just they, they co-evolve somehow. They're both very conserved, but I love to, to, to really think that, uh, the, that maybe this is the reason. So maybe I could follow up on this. Is, is, there, is there a reason to think that, in fact, the two functions may not be sort of totally biochemically independent in the sense that the effect is fundamentally on membrane integrity or, you know, membrane residency time of a channel and some transporters. And so at the end of the day, you, um, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we really, so for, to answer to this, we really need to do this uh, type of rescue experiments and kind of making uh, the, the, the two uh, uh, so the transport and the channel independent from each other. Um, maybe your computer, maybe there's nothing to do with that. Uh, um, the other group tried to actually block uh, um, or to use a, a rapamycin to play with the mTOR because they were thinking that maybe this was going through the mTOR modulation, which is not the case, so they didn't see anything. Um, one possibility that we really thought at the beginning is it was uh, that we are still, you know, one way to be sure that this is not the case. Um, that maybe there is a switch to metabolic uh, type of pathways, and so that this leads to a different type of firing. Um, Tim Fogel, that is uh, at IST as well, uh, it was a nice view. It's a nice view showing that eventually uh, spontaneous activity is, uh, is needed to maintain the survival of the neuron, and so this is uh, um, pyruvate dependent, uh, uh, and, and so. One possibility is that by having this difference in branching amino acids, we affect that, but we don't think that this is the case. We are changing the really piece by piece, um, but we don't think that this is okay. 
maybe one uh, again doing the rescue experiment would probably be the best way to uh, to answer to this and maybe um, some form of proteomics is uh, some additional type of experiment we have to do but uh, you're yeah that's we're checking that. could it also be a reflection of a temporal difference so for instance you know that that the idea that at some point perhaps the neurons are not as dependent on the kv channel so even though the defect is still there there is a compensatory mechanism you know what i'm you know what yeah. i'm trying to get at that, that in fact it's related to what the neuron is doing as opposed to the to the transporter itself like what context the neuron is in at different times of its life i i totally take it and in fact this afternoon i went to lisa and said lisa i know but you know i go in the house population and, uh, and and so one possibility is uh, is really that so because when we look at the fire uh, the fire the action potential properties this action potential looks actually good and more mature so maybe is actually so th th there is a lot of work that suggests that uh, neurons have to sort of adapt to the um so that there is a neuron a spontaneous neuron activity and this is uh, important for uh, uh, controlling the number of cells and then maybe one possibility is that the neuron has to adapt to the to the correct type of activity and so maybe those neurons there even if they're more look more mature they eventually behave in a different way and so they are eliminated so that's that's certainly possible i think the intriguing part of all of this is uh, why is that limited to that time period, right? So if it would be an effect that you see all over, then you say, well, it could be that uh, then, you know, the, uh, all the other neurons are changing and so those neurons are surviving later on. But it's not the case because uh, that those uh, that the firing properties are not different anymore. So they are just really different in within this uh, yeah. time point. Okay, so you mentioned pyruvate, so that leads us to this, I guess, this question from Pablo M, uh, who says, uh, great talk, some uh, potassium channels are expressed in mitochondria and regulate mitochondrial function and ROS generation. Uh, do you think that there is a metabolic problem in your model or, you know, have you looked at mitochondrial function? In this we, well, um, so to be honest, we have looked in the past, so we are looking at it. So we are we are exactly looking at that. We don't think so. We don't see any evidence so far. We also looked at that uh, very back then with the BCK decay, but again, this could be a bit different, but in that case, there was no difference whatsoever. What we think, in fact, is the branching amino acid contribute very little to the TSA cycle because uh, most of the of the acetyl CoA that gets into that is, is coming from other ways. So, so that probably that's why depleting the branching amino acid have not a big effect on mitochondria uh, um, uh, directly. But we, we definitely are checking that. So one uh, one uh, thing is that uh, so in the heart has been shown that the branching amino acids level are directly regulating the activity of the uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase. So we are checking that now, but uh, the, it does uh, at a different uh, level. So the level of branching amino acids is completely different in, in the brain and in the, in the heart, and so and in the blood as well. And so we don't think that that the range that we are working, concentration that we are working in the brain, uh, this is uh, has an effect. But uh, um, and we don't see any evidence so far. But we are checking, double checking, triple checking to be sure. Okay, and uh, our last question, I guess, is uh, from uh, Paula Belosta. Nice work. Is IGF signaling, uh, hmm. is IGF signaling perhaps signaling or responsive with the SL with the SLCA seven channel, exactly Not like you that. are seeing saying now? Not, I guess you. Got it. Right. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Uh, uh, yes. No, it, it's actually, we don't see that any difference. This was also something that we checked back then with the BCKDK and the very initially with the SLC75 patients, uh, uh, but we don't see any difference there. And uh, again, I, I think the main point, one of the main points here is that uh, whatever it has has been found uh, looking at, for instance, deprivation of amino acids in a kind of acute way, 
it probably doesn't apply really here in the brain when we, de we deplete in a, in a kind of a chronic situation. Mm -hmm. And that the, whatever is a gain of function is different with a lock of permanent loss of function. So uh, we have to be uh, to rethink a little bit uh, uh, maybe what is, and we are doing actually, we have a very big large project in, in, the, in, in the lab that we are looking at uh, all factors that are amino acid sensitive uh, uh, in the brain to really understand how in a sort of a chronic situation uh, uh, changes uh, uh, different um, response and pathways. Uh, but uh, so long, sorry, long answer to answer, basically no, we don't think I have any difference. Okay, Maya, grazie mille. Uh, no more questions. To everyone for listening and for the good feedback in general. So thank you everyone for uh, being here. Thank you, Gaia, for a great talk and a wonderful discussion. I want to remind all the students and postdocs that um, Worldwide Neuro is uh, looking for young uh, scientists who would like to present a short make a short presentation prior to the main talk so if you're interested please send an email to the worldwide neuro email um uh, all pis please send this give this message to your to your people um uh and uh yeah stay safe stay healthy take care of each other and yourself so so huh there is next week there is also this neuro match uh, uh conference yes. That is also yeah. interesting for some. Absolutely. So, um, you know, for better or worse, looks like Worldwide Neuro will be f with us for a while. Um, you know, and so take care of yourselves and each other. Uh, and uh, see you again soon. And uh, visit the website to uh, hear about all the fantastic talks that are scheduled. Thanks again, Gaia. See you around. Bye.